Awesome. All right. Well, I feel like we should pray again. Let's pray. Father God, thank you uh, again for uh, this day, this this time, uh, Lord, the time that we set aside to uh, c- kind of put away all of the things that are a distraction to us. And God, we, we, we dedicate, we consecrate this time for you. God, I pray you just sharpen our minds that, Lord, you just help us to focus on your word, God, what you might be speaking to us this morning. Uh, just speak to us through your word, I pray. Uh, God, we love you. God, we love your word. We love uh, what it says, how it changes us, how it transforms us. Uh, Lord, thank you. We pray it all in your son, Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen, amen. All right, so yeah, we've been, uh, well, I should say we've been in a series, but we started this, uh, this series last week called The Upside Down Kingdom. Before we get into this, though, uh, I, I don't know about you, but I always feel like, like especially this point in the summer, there's a lot of pressure, right, to get stuff done around the house. Anybody else feeling that pressure? Yeah, <laughs> lots of guys raising their hands. Okay. Uh, I blame a lot of that pressure on HGTV. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I'm a little bit bitter. <laughs> okay. we, my, my wife and I have been working on our backyard. It seems like a five-year uh, project, and we're, so we're getting a little bit more done. But I, I really feel like uh, that HGTV is responsible for the work that I'm doing this summer. I don't know what it is, but, but you know, when you, when you watch these programs, we're just, uh, we're just riveted by what happens, right? They, and they hook you, they hook you by the promise of this finished product, right? So they take this, this old house, or they take this old swimming pool, or they take this old backyard, and they transform it into something that is, like, amazing, right? And so, like, all throughout the program, they kind of give you just little, little tastes of, of what they're doing. And then at the end, it's the big reveal, right? There's, they show you the, the before pictures and then the after pictures. So I thought it would be fun uh, to, to look at uh, some before and after pictures, okay? So in honor of my backyard project, these are before and after pictures of backyards. And I'm praying that my backyard is going to look like some of these. I don't know. So I promise, so you're going to see these pictures, you're going to be like, no way, that's not the same house. But I promise you, they are. So this, this first house, this is before. You ready? There's after. Pretty amazing what a coat of paint will do, huh? Man. All right, that's the after. Okay? Here's before. I, I, this looks like my backyard, kind of. And, ready? After. Ah, pretty nice. All right. Before. Oops. Oh, that's like a spoiler right there. Dang it. All right. So there's before. Right? This guy needs a level. I don't know who built his deck, but <laughs> obviously in need of a professional carpenter. All right. So this is before and after. Ooh. Yeah. Pretty nice. I really like this last one, though. This is before, barely even see the house, and you're not even going to recognize it. Wow, there's the after. Pretty amazing, right? So, you know, we get, we get hooked by these, these transformations. We think, oh man, honey, we could do that. <laughs> this before, and then this after. We've, we've been in a series called Upside Down Kingdom. So last week, we started in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Jesus begins his public ministry, and he begins it with this statement. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, you're going, you're walking away from God. Turn 180 degrees, start walking towards God, because God's kingdom, it is at hand. It is here, it is here now. That's how Jesus begins his ministry with that statement. And then in chapter 5 of the book of Matthew, Jesus begins to teach his disciples what that kingdom looks like. 
And as he teaches, you begin to see that the kingdom of God is much different from the world. It's much different from uh, the culture maybe that we're used to. Many of the things that Jesus says are like upside down and backwards, okay, to what we're used to. Jesus says, in, in my Father's kingdom, okay, we love our enemies and we pray for those who persecute us. In my Father's kingdom, the first are last and the last are first, okay? Backwards, upside down. That's why a lot of people refer to God's kingdom as the upside down kingdom. And as we got into chapter 5, we said, uh, and we noticed that uh, Jesus, as, as he begins to teach his disciples, this is what my God, my, my Father's kingdom looks like. These are the, these are the characteristics of my Father's kingdom. Jesus basically says, we are blessed when we pursue this upside down kingdom. We are blessed, we are happy, we are content, okay, we are, we are uh, right in our relationship with God when we pursue the upside down kingdom. How do we pursue the upside down kingdom? I like what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, chapter 12, verse 2. He says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God of God. We are blessed when we pursue the upside down kingdom, right? We pursue the upside down kingdom by allowing God to transform our minds, to, to change our thinking. All right? I, I, I might suggest this. People, people would say that, that God's kingdom is, is upside down and backwards, but, but let me suggest this, that it's really the world that's upside down and backwards in God's kingdom that's right side up. And God needs to, to change our mindsets. He needs to change our thinking when it comes to how we live our lives, how we spend our money, how we interact with the people in our lives, our relationships with our kids, our spouse, the people that we work with, our neighbors, we are blessed when we pursue the upside-down kingdom. When God begins to, to, to change our mindset and, and change our thinking, okay, he blesses us. And so we, we started looking at chapter 5 of the book of Matthew uh, again. Uh, let's go ahead and turn there. If you've got your Bibles this morning, um, go ahead and turn to chapter 5 in the book of Matthew. So last week we looked at Verses 3, 4, and 5. We looked at the first three verses, the first three Beatitudes. All right? Verse 3, uh, those who recognize their need for God are blessed. Okay? Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus says. So those who recognize their, their, their deep need for Him. You know, the world values self-sufficiency and independence. And God needs to, to change our, our mindset. He needs to, to change our perspective and help us recognize that uh, it's the poor in spirit, those who recognize their need for God, that are blessed. Uh, those, who are, those who mourn are blessed in verse 4. All right? Uh, because in mourning we ex experience God's comfort. You know, the, the world runs from anything that's hard. The world runs from mourning and difficulty. But because of God's comfort, because of God's presence, we're able to, to run towards it and embrace it. Matter of fact, God does some of his best work in our pain. So God needs to change our mindset when it comes to how we view the hard things in our lives. And then in verse 5, uh, blessed are the meek or the humble. Remember, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. 
the world's default is to uh, to put itself first, uh, to look out for number one. But God needs to to change our perspective, change our mindset when it comes to how we view the people in our lives. We need to think of ourselves less, consider the needs of others before our own. The Apostle Paul says. But let me say this as as we talk about the difference right between God's kingdom and the world, I, I think that this is really important to understand. Uh, your neighbor, okay, uh, the people you work with, uh, maybe those around you that don't follow Jesus, they are not the enemy. I think too often in the church when we talk about uh, the world uh, as being uh, evil, as being the enemy, we, we lump the people around us in, into that category. But those people are not the enemy. As a matter of fact, Paul says in, in Ephesians chapter 6 that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the dark spiritual forces of this world. Our, we, we have an enemy, and, and he wants to, to, to seek us out, and he wants to see us fail, and he wants to destroy us. And that's why he's, he's turned our culture upside down. That's why, that's why the, the way he's influenced our world is, is so opposed to who God is and, and to his kingdom. He is the enemy. His way of thinking is, is the enemy. The, the people who, who you know that uh, maybe that, that neighbor, that, that family member uh, that doesn't know Jesus, that, that doesn't follow him, they're not the enemy. Those are the people that God loves. Those are the people that we want to bring the kingdom to. Amen? Chapter 5, verse 6. All right, here we go. Pick it up from last week. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever been hungry? Have you ever been hungry? Of course you've been hungry, right? I, I remember going on some mission trips with Jason Fry. Raise your hand if you ever went on a mission trip with Jason Fry. Okay. So if you went on a mission trip with Jason Fry, you know that Jason was a major cheapskate when it came to food. Okay? So your choices, right, of food on a mission trip with Jason Fry was peanut butter and jelly or bologna. Those were your choices, okay? <laughs> so after two weeks in Mexico with Jason, uh, you were kind of hungry. Now, we would, we would go down to Mexico, uh, It'd be about a two-week stint. Uh, we'd go down, we'd build some houses, and we would stay at this uh, this mission uh, agency. And they actually fed us fairly well. It wasn't really food that we were used to. Ate a lot of boiled cactus. I don't know if you've ever had cactus. It's not too bad. But I remember, like, the greatest thing about the trip home was knowing that as soon as we crossed the border and got into San Diego, our first stop, was in and out Burger, right? <laughs> that was our first stop after coming into the United States. It's like in and out Burger was the light at the end of the tunnel. I can do this. I can do two weeks of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and bologna because I know that in two weeks, it's going to be in and out Burger, all right? If you, you, you've probably been in situations like that where uh, you've just been craving something. You've been, you've been hungry. And, and in verse 6 of chapter 5, as Jesus talks about the kingdom of God and what it looks like, he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. All right, righteousness means literally to be in a right relationship with. Righteousness is not a list of do's and don'ts. In other words, if you're hungry for righteousness, you're hungry to be in a right relationship with God. All right, you're, you're hungry to, to follow him. You're, you're hungry to, to do the things that he's called you to do. You hunger and thirst to be a good son or a, a good daughter. When you hunger and thirst for righteousness, Jesus says you will be filled. Literally, that word means you'll be satisfied. When you hunger and thirst for righteousness. I mean, we all want to be satisfied. But the real question is, how will you satisfy your hunger and your thirst? 
I have a really, really bad habit of not eating lunch during the week. Uh, I, I'm pretty like, um, I'm a terrible multitasker, like awful, okay? I'm a terrible, terrible multitasker. But when I get on a project, like I get focused on one thing, I'm like a dog with a bone. Okay, and uh, I like forget what time it is. I forget uh, everything else. I even forget to eat. And I'll get to like four or five o'clock in the afternoon, and I realize I haven't had lunch. And so I, I remember one day this last year, uh, I had been working at my desk. I don't even think I had gotten up in like four hours. And I got to like four o'clock, and I'm like, man, I am really hungry. So I did what I do sometimes. And that is, I went to Burger King, right? <laughs> I don't eat at many fast food restaurants, but I really like Burger King. All right, so I got up, I went to Burger King, and I got a Whopper and had my snack. I came back and worked for about another hour, and then I went home. So I came through the front door, and as soon as I got through the door, I remembered my wife said, hey, I'm making a really nice dinner tonight. And so I got through the front door, and, and it, it just hit me. Of course, the smell of this really great meal that she had been making hit me. And the first thing she says to me, honey, are you ready to eat? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, I am. I am, I am ready to eat. And, uh, you know, she she'd made this, like, really great meal. And uh, I actually, I'd never told her that story until this week when I was going to include it in this. Uh, I'm like, okay, I got to tell you this because you're going to hear it on Sunday. All right. But I was, you know, I was already full. You know, I had, I had like sacrificed this really great meal for a bunch of garbage. You know, I'd had this really lousy snack when I could have been filled and satisfied by this great meal that my wife had made. Right? Uh, so if you want to be hungry for a good meal, that means you have to, you can't fill up on garbage, all right? Your, your stomach only has so much space, all right? Your life, your life only has so much space, all right? You, you only have so much capacity. Um, and this is where the upside down kingdom differs from, from the world, all right? The world tends to, to want us to fill up on things that, that don't bring lasting satisfaction. You know, they, they want to find satisfaction in, in possessions, uh, in hobbies, in relationships, um, sometimes in drugs and alcohol. There are all these things that, that the world looks to, to, to find satisfaction that, that won't provide lasting satisfaction. That's why Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, so the next chapter, Jesus says to his disciples, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust will destroy and where thieves will break in and steal. But instead, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. There's a blessing for those who allow God to transform their thinkings, their thinking in regards to what they long for. The blessing for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness is that they will be filled. If we fill our lives up with all of these other things and, and don't make room for a, a hunger and a thirst for him, then we, we just won't be satisfied because nothing else like really, truly satisfies. People who pursue righteousness are merciful. In Matthew 5, verse 7, Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. The merciful here, so if, if you were to study the word mercy all throughout, especially the New Testament, there are lots of words that are kind of connected to this idea of mercy. Some words like kindness, uh, generosity. Specifically here in verse 7, uh, the word means uh, to uh, have compassion for the lowly. To have compassion on the lowly. And God is, God is serious about this idea of mercy. 
in, in Exodus chapter 22, God says to the Israelites, he says, uh, if you mistreat any widow or orphan, these are his words, he says, if you mistreat any widow or orphan, I will kill you with the sword. Your wives will become widows and your children orphans. Okay, God is, is, is very concerned about protecting the lowly, about having compassion on those who cannot protect themselves, who cannot provide for themselves. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. All right? God says that the people have the power to help and choose to help. Those are the merciful. In Luke chapter 10, uh, Jesus talks about mercy uh, by, by telling this parable. And you, and you all know the story of the Good Samaritan, right? So uh, uh, in this situation, this, this young man comes to Jesus. He says, uh, how, do I, uh, how do I see the kingdom of God? Jesus says, obey the law and the prophets. He said, done that. Uh, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, okay. Uh, and then he, then he asks Jesus this question, who's my neighbor? And so Jesus tells him this story about this guy who's jumped by robbers and left for dead. And along comes a priest who crosses to the other side of the road. And then along comes a Levite. These are both really religious people, okay, the religious leaders of the day. They both walk by this guy who's lying, dying on the road. And then along comes this Samaritan. And you probably know that Samaritans and Jews did not think fondly of each other, right? The Samaritans were not thought very highly of uh, in any regard. But, but it's the Samaritan that comes along and rescues this poor man that's dying in the road. He picks him up. He takes care of him. He takes him to an inn. He tells the innkeeper, hey, I have to, I have to leave, but, but here's some money. Take care of this guy. If there are some extra expenses, I'll, I'll cover them when I come back through. And so Jesus then says this to the man who asked the question, who's my neighbor? Uh, he says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, go and do the same. Unfortunately, I think in our world, uh, our world tends to, to just take advantage of and, 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 and just chew up and, and spit out those who cannot care for themselves. Uh, if you watched the news at all yesterday, you know about the 26 uh, people that were injured and 20 killed in El Paso by a gunman. Our, our world loves to, to take advantage of people. Um, man, even even this week, somebody tried to scam me on Craigslist, okay? Uh, there, just, there, there just is no lack of stories about people taking advantage of people. The world searches for what it can get out of people, but as people who are pursuing the upside-down kingdom, we search for how we can add value to people. We look for ways that we can bring value to people and to their lives. We need God to transform our minds when it comes to how we view people. Matthew 18, Jesus tells another parable. He tells the, this parable of the unmerciful servant. Uh, so in this parable, uh, there's, there's a king, and uh, he has a servant who owes him some money. And so he calls the servant and he says, and it's a lot of money. And the king says, pay up or you're going to jail. And the servant begs the king for mercy. And so the king says, okay, your debt is forgiven, go. And so the man goes and he finds one of his friends who owes him some money. And he says to the guy, pay up or I'm sending you to jail. Because in that culture, if you owed a debt that you couldn't pay, you, they, you could get sent to jail until your family could pay the debt. So the servant who'd been forgiven finds his friend who owes him some money, says, look, you owe me some money, pay up. The man says, I can't pay it. That's not very much money. The guy says, well, pay up 
And, and, and the servant says, well, I, I can't, I, I can't afford it. And the man says, fine, you're going to jail. And he throws him in jail. Well, of course, the king hears about what happened and he finds the first servant and he throws him in prison as well. And, and the point of the parable is, is this, that we are to follow the king's example. We are to follow the king's example. See, we had a debt that we couldn't pay. We had a debt that, that we, we did not have the resources to cover. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve his mercy. And yet, he gave it to me anyway. Merciful people understand that they have been shown mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And then finally, in verse 8, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's not greatness of intellect, but purity of affection that enables us to see God. Charles Spurgeon, uh, the great uh, preacher, said, It is not greatness of intellect, but purity of affection that enables us to see God. The heart is like the source of our motivation. The heart is, is where is the source of, of, of the why for what we do, what we do. The Pharisees uh, in Jesus' day were really concerned with the, the outside of a person. All right? They were obsessed with these you know, trivial matters of religion, uh, but God was really clear to them that he is more concerned with what's on the inside, with the motivation for what we do. It's not enough to do the right things. God is most concerned with the motivation behind the action. And Jesus was pretty direct with the Pharisees. In Matthew 23, Jesus said to the disciples, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside they are full of dead man's bones and every impurity. In the same way, on the outside you seem righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. What is on the inside matters. You know, the world is obsessed with appearances, with what people see on the outside, often without any care of what's on the inside. This is a this is a picture of the Hawkins family. And uh, the Hawkins family bought a house in K Falls, Southern Oregon. Uh, they thought they were getting this amazing deal, $35,000. Uh, they, they've been saving for five years to buy their first home. They found this house, $35,000. It needed some work. It needed some new windows uh, and some paint. They thought, man, this is a great deal. Uh, they didn't have a lot of money, and so they couldn't hire a house inspector. So they had a buddy who was a carpenter uh, come and do the inspection for them. And he said, yeah, these windows, the furnace is probably going to need to be replaced, but the bones are good, right? And so they went in, and they remodeled this house, they painted, and they moved in. And within a couple weeks, they started to uh, get really sick. Uh, nosebleeds, headaches, uh, it was awful. And so they ordered this test kit, this $50 test kit, and tested the walls and the ceilings and the floors. And come to find out, the house, before they purchased it, had been a meth house. And so all of the chemicals from the cooking of the meth had seeped into the walls, into the ceiling, into the floors. And it was making them sick. They had to move out of the house. They lost their $35,000 investment. The moral to that story is, number one, always hire a house inspector. Right, Jay? Okay. And number two, uh, what is on the inside really, really matters. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Our world is, is super concerned with what people see on the outside. We ought to be more concerned about 
what's on the inside. God needs to transform our thinking. As a people who are pursuing the upside-down kingdom, we should be asking ourselves, how am I doing on the inside? I think it can be easy for us, even like in this environment, to get to a place where you're feeling dry, uh, disconnected, empty, lonely, and come to church every Sunday morning, and for the most part, everybody sees this this different picture on the outside. People ask you, how you doing? Fine, fine. How's life? Good. But really on the inside, you are hurting and struggling and maybe even dying. Purity, renewal, restoration isn't something that we can do or can accomplish on our own. David in uh, Psalm 51 uh, writes this prayer, right? He is broken and separated from God because of his sin. And uh, I love this prayer from Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12. David says, God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Uh, He was really worried that God was going to leave him. But he says, restore the joy of your salvation to me and give me a willing spirit. How are you doing on the inside this morning? What is on the inside really, really matters to God. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. So as we wrap up this morning, maybe maybe a couple questions to ask yourself. Uh, number one, uh, what, how am I doing in my hunger and thirst for righteousness? Are there things in my life, maybe, that are filling me up so that I don't have space, that I don't have room to hunger and thirst for God? Maybe ask yourself this question, how can I add value to someone around me this week? Take time to reflect on the mercy you've been shown. And then thirdly, Take time to just pour your heart out to God, especially if you're hurting and struggling, feeling separated and alone. It's no good to come here, to come to church, to to do this thing on Sunday morning uh, when you are broken and hurting inside. This ought to be, I I hope, a place where you can be honest and and, uh, that there's an opportunity to be who you really are and no pressure to put on a mask and to try and portray something that you're not. And so as we, we wrap up this morning, uh, I'm going to pray, and uh, and I just want to especially invite you this morning. Uh, you know, we would love to pray with you. We'd love to pray for you. If you have a need, we would love to pray for that need. But especially if you're, you're hurting and struggling and broken this morning, uh, we would especially love to be able to pray with you. And so we just want to invite you to do that. As I pray, Father, thank you again for this morning. God, thank you for uh, God, thank you for the mercy that we have been shown. God, thank you for your concern, uh, Lord, over what is going on on the inside. Father, we 